So thank you very much. Welcome back to the last panel here of the day, which is um, the, bank, uh, ba the panel on banking in a digitalized world. How is modern technology driving actually the way banking is going to be shaped in the future? And if you look at it a little bit in a broader terms, if we talk about digitalization, a lot of industries has been, have been disrupted already. Think about video rental companies, for example, they just vanished. And other industries do face a lot of change as well. But it was quite late that this came also to banking. And that that is one reason, of course, that the banking industry is a lot more regulated and that banks are much more vital to our system as such. We know that from the financial crisis, what happens to the world when a bank is actually going down, just to remember Lehman. So that is one reason. But still, I mean, change is coming. We know that big tech is coming, fintechs are coming. We have a lot of uh, alternative banking um, yeah, services on offer. And the big question is what comes next and where do we stand? now and that will be the topic of our panel here and I'm very happy to be joined by a very excellent uh, yeah, group of panelists or co-panelists here on on stage. Uh, let me first introduce perhaps from the far right Gurkham Kozeklu, Chief Analytic Officer at ING. ING is one of the banks who is probably most advanced when it comes to digitalization uh, in Europe. Next to him sits Helena Forrest, Head of Branch, Optimization and Expansion at Deutsche Bank. So she's an expert more um, on, on what uh, AI and also digitalization means for the product and the business side of things. Um, in the middle is uh, Joachim Wurmeling, member of the executive board of Bundesbank and also responsible for banking regulation, IT and risk, but also for the digitalization of the Bundesbank itself. So it will be interesting to hear what digitalization actually means for the Bundesbank or a central bank and how processes are going to change. Then, um, of course, um, Hauke Stars, member of the executive board at Deutsche Börse, so an expert on technology and blockchain, for example. Perhaps we can talk about which technology is actually perhaps the new thing for 2020 and going forward. And of course, last but not least, Penti Hakarainen, sorry, that's fine, that's fine. <laughs> the ECB representative uh, to the supervisory board um, here, the SSM. Um, and we are going to talk of course, like what's the latest in terms of technology and what you're doing as well to stay ahead of the curve with all the technology changes uh, for the banking industry. Let me start off with a question though, or jump directly into, into the myths where we stand in terms of uh, digitalization technology with you, Gorkum. What do you think, what's like the latest hottest topic in terms of digitalization of the banking scene? We are living in a VUCA world, so if I comment on the latest development tomorrow, it's already the day before yesterday. Uh, so, well, what we observe uh, uh, in the last one, two years, three major shifts in the trends of digitalization, uh, and one is um, the shift uh, from uh, fintech to, uh, from fintech as companies, uh, to financial technology in traditional banks. So the previous suggestions that the whole banking sector will be disrupted by fintechs, and all, that has not materialized. Uh, it's rather the other way around, that banks are um, uh, catching up with their and, and boosting their technology, technological development. They're cooperating uh, with uh, uh, fintech companies. Uh, so uh, the center of gravity of the innovation has shifted to the classical banking sector. The second item here I wanted to mention is that uh, there's a shift from back end, uh, from front end digitalization to back end digitalization. Uh, so from the, let's say, fancy apps for the consumers uh, to really um, um, changing processes uh, in the heart of the banking business, which is for us as supervisors much more difficult because it's not so easy to, uh, uh, to find out. And the third uh, trend, uh, I would say, is from uh, processes to analytics 
So with application of artificial intelligence, machine learning, algorithms, and so on, uh, the analytical element of digitalization is, gives much more importance in banks. And here, of course, supervisors come into play because they, uh, these applications also concern risk-sensitive elements. Um, what's your view here, Penti? Perhaps you're also like looking at the broader European picture. Um, <clears throat> what is like the topic you're especially interested in currently as a regulator? Well, it, it is uh, very much like uh, Joachim took up the issue. It is uh, it is so that uh, modern te technology has become increasingly important, and it is uh, when it comes to fintech. It is uh, not only that it is important in, in terms of our current uh, banking, but uh, it is contributing, contributing a lot to so-called financial inc inclusion, meaning that uh, in developing countries there are people, wider and wider population, which is, uh, which is having access to uh, financial services, and that is a big, big benefit. When it comes to more advanced uh, banking industries, there we see different ways of using this. And uh, when it comes to us as uh, supervisors, uh, it was so that FSI, Financial Stability Institute under BIS, made a very recent study, surveyed uh, 37 uh, national supervisors, how they make use of uh, subtech supervisory technology. And, uh, and uh, the conclusion is, uh, is that it is rather element, uh, elementary phase, so that, uh, or exploration phase, uh, so that uh, uh, we start uh, to use it. Uh, and in our case, in the ECB, it is in three areas very important. First is uh, improving our own work processes. There it is not only costs, it is also improving quality of our supervision. And uh, that is a uh, uh, very, very important uh, uh, part. And uh, second is that there are in, in uh, financing very complex issues. In, in uh, incomprehensible information, which uh, with modern technology, we can even create uh, some good conclusions uh, from entirely un unstructured information which is submitted to us. Mm. And, uh, and uh, then the third is uh, not only for, for us, but it is also to banks. And that is, uh, that is uh, data uh, reporting. And uh, there with modern technology, we can have uh, common data warehouses and, uh, and uh, make it uh, make it more streamlined and uh, sort of administrative burden will be reduced. Uh, Austrian authorities are well advanced in this front and in all, all these areas I can give examples, but uh, we try to keep abreast what uh, happens there. And uh, banks are so dynamic and uh, just when hearing from Gerken what uh, they are doing, it's just yeah, uh, let there's us, a lot of work. Yeah, let us hear from Gerken where we stand in terms of technology and uh, what's like the latest hot topic you're yeah. working on and uh, where you see the future. When I was reflecting on basically what is the hot topics in technology, when you go back to you know, 15, 20 years, there has always been topics hot for banks around technology. And we talked about moving from mainframes to client server architectures. We saw the internet banking early 2000s, then we said mob mobile banking now, in some countries, 90% of our customers are mobile banking users. Um, so I think banks are always, banking is always impacted by technology and that's what makes it a bit also dynamic and fun, honestly, for us. And I, I, I like that saying that Bill Gates said, I think back in 93 or 94, banks are necessary, sorry, banking is necessary, banks are not necessary. That basically say that, you know, for me is there needs to be a constant renewal by using technology, but also uh, in terms of customer experience that we create and uh, user experience and so on in how we do banking. The hot topics these days are obviously, you know, AI, machine learning uh, related areas and, um, and things like the uh, distributed ledger technologies, blockchain technologies, like I think, uh, and also open banking, which is driven by uh, PST2, uh, but also fintechs and so on, a bit more open banking related technologies are, are hot topics. I, I think, you know, um, 
uh, within these, AI is probably the most uh, impactful one. And um, I, simply because if you compare it with earlier technological changes, internet banking, mobile banking, etc., they were mostly on the customer facing the channel, the interface part of the world. AI is more pervasive in the sense that virtually any part of the bank that you do customer service or take a decision today or do some operational activities will be impacted by AI. Uh, it not only brings efficiencies in how you do operations, but I think more importantly in you know, decision-making power by processing huge amounts of data in, a, in an objective, unbiased way is a huge potential impact for, for banks. How much, how, how well are we prepared in Europe for, <clears throat> for AI? Because if I talk to CEOs um, yeah, who are also very interested in, in AI, many of them are saying that China will just overtake us to, uh, by, I don't know, 100 kilometer an hour because of they have so much, so much data. Yeah, so I mean, uh, in indeed, I think the main difference there is our um, um, attitude or perception around data and data privacy has huge differences among the US, China, and, and, and how we do it in Europe. Um, and that has an implication in terms of the amount of data that you can use to train your algorithms, and, and, and data is the fuel for your algorithm. So indeed, uh, especially when it comes to areas like uh, vision technologies, face recognition, um, um, image recognition, in those areas we see a, a gap. But I think not only in data, in terms of attitude of the, um, of, of, um, of the government and also uh, investment society in, towards AI is very different in China uh, compared to US and even to the US and definitely to Europe. Yeah. Uh, if you look at you know, 25 b uh, billion euros or dollars of investment have went into, into AI last year, it's, you know, hundredfold increase compared to 10 years ago, and China has the higher, highest share in, in, that, uh, in that investment. So that is, a, I think, it's not only about data attitude, but also the importance given as a national priority to AI is, is it creates some difference. Uh, Helena, you are an expert on AI as well, but also um, on like the business, what it does to the business side of things at a bank. So how are you using that like in practical terms? What are you working on? I guess from the business perspective, technology is an enabler. So from the business perspective, we are not looking at what is the next nice technology that we want just to implement for the sake of implementing it. Your mic is not working. Your mic is not on, I guess. Is that? I don't know. Is that working? It's, yep. yep, it's good. Thank okay. You. So I just repeat myself? Yes. Or? No, no. <laughs> I was just stating that um, from the business perspective, technology is an enabler. So we're not looking just to implement new fancy technology just for the sake of implementing it. It has to serve a purpose. And it has to serve a purpose for us as a business. Um, and what is the most important part for us as a business is, of course, to satisfy our customers. So from that perspective, um, any type of use cases when it comes to AI, machine learning, RPA, are always identified and prioritized based on strategic decisions um, with regards to our client strategy. Um, I was actually quite surprised a couple of years ago when we initially started introducing RPA um, to the business, um, how easily and how comfortable people felt accepting that technology and potentially have digital workers aside um, either supporting staff or working for um, particular managers. Um, now, after a couple of years experimenting with RPA, we are also now using machine learning and more advanced um, technologies for that purpose as well. So um, I guess it is a journey. It requires definitely commitment and um, yeah, internal employees to embrace that technology in order to really um, scale up and to be able to deliver the benefits that we would like to deliver to our customers and to the individual businesses. So, um, yeah. But do you think that like the banking scene, I mean, you're a rep representative of Deutsche Bank, or, or, um, has waken up to the fact that this is like the future and digitalization is the future and do they allocate enough funds in order to really create a digitalized bank? Absolutely, and I don't think Deutsche Bank is any different to um, any of the other European banks where 
um, digital transformation has been on top of our strategic ad agenda for a number of years and will continue to be. It is a journey, it is a complex journey. As most incumbent um, banks, we have legacy infrastructure that we have accumulated over the last couple of decades, layers up and layers of systems code um, that requires replacements, upgrades, um, but the key focus for us is to I guess, remove the complexity that we have accumulated over the decades um, to make the uh, um, architecture a lot leaner, more flexible, um, moving a lot more towards microservices rather than monolithic platforms that are quite complex and um, expensive to manage and to maintain. And then, of course, introduce things such as machine learning, AI, blockchain, and some of the newer technology into that mix. Um, and I guess it's always going to be a balance between being able to uh, upgrade, maintain your business as usual infrastructure versus new investments into innovative products, into new technologies that you might want to experiment with um, that might open up new business models and revenue streams. So it's, it's managing that balance is, I guess, the trick yeah. to the success. Let's talk a bit about blockchain because I think m most people think about blockchain in connection with um, yeah, uh, cryptocurrencies, but it also has other use or potential use. Perhaps how can you can um, yeah perhaps explain it to us <laughs> where we stand here um, around blockchain. Um where are we standing here? Uh, I think a blockchain has been a, a subject in the discussions for, for quite some time, um, two years at least, and there was a huge hype and a huge expectation about this technology. And uh, for people that uh, have been working in technology, we know the so-called Gardner hype cycle, and you often see these with new technologies, they are hyped a lot, and then you see a, a deep frustration. Um, in between, I must admit, I had the feeling that uh, blockchain is going the same way into a deep uh, um, a depression and frustration. Um, I would say uh, we see a more rational view on, on blockchain and the, uh, the opportunities this technology is providing at this moment. Um, uh, but there is also some, some frustration about uh, what, what can be uh, achieved with the technology. The technology, uh, we as Deutsche Börse thought in the beginning it could be a technology that uh, in the end uh, uh, will, will serve us uh, as for completely changing the technology under the, the CSD uh, um, uh, in the future. Uh, looking at our current view on that, uh, I must say this is uh, far out um, uh, on, on the opportunities. The technology is not uh, stable enough, it's not um, mature enough uh, to be applied in, um, in companies like ours uh, for such large-scale uh, applications. Um, company in, in Australia, ASX, um, our uh, uh, counterpart in, in Australia, they are uh, bringing their whole uh, uh, infrastructure on blockchain and struggling a lot with this. This doesn't mean uh, that this technology has no potential. There is potential and that there are applications that uh, will uh, uh, help or will, can be used uh, for um, uh, to, to uh, bring reliable uh, um, uh, uh, or a reliable infrastructure um, uh, into uh, the system, the financial system. Uh, we're using it uh, for um, securities lending uh, infrastructure. Uh, high liquid uh, uh, assets um, uh, will be in the future uh, managed via such a technology. Um, but we need to say here, we could have done it also with traditional technologies. We are using the technology currently because we believe there is a potential. We need to stay uh, close to this technology to understand where we can use it in the future. And um, that's uh, the, the current uh, situation uh, about, about... Perhaps we can talk about the risk aspect of that technology as well, because clearly when we talk about artificial intelligence, applying new technologies, there's also a big risk of like failure, as you were saying with um, the Australian stock market operator. I think you have a, a view you know, on, on where the risks are as well associated to like new technology and um, where regulators have to have a look at. 
Well, of course, there are risks associated with digitalization, but first of all, I would like to say that the Bundesbank is very positive about digitalization, uh, also from the economic point of view. Uh, it's innovation, uh, it fosters uh, productivity, it brings benefits to the consumers, but also to the, uh, uh, to the banks, but to the, uh, to the uh, economy as a whole. Uh, so uh, we, uh, as supervisors, see that digitization of the financial sector is also a positive thing and you mentioned already uh, the benefits of algorithms which are not biased and these kind of things they don't make mistakes and so on so uh, this is uh, the, uh, the, f the the approach but of course uh, it's our uh, task to care about the risks and the challenge for the supervisors is uh, twofold one is that it is not only the technology in itself, but it is that the business models are completely changing of banks, operating models are changing, processes are changing. Um, there's an unbundling of uh, the uh, value chain and so on. So the animal we are supervising changes completely and this is of course could also uh, bring about changes for the way we supervise these, uh, these entities. And the second uh, issue and the second challenge is uh, of course um, that um, our focus usually is the financial soundness and safety uh, of an institution and not the technological. Uh, so our examiners, they are experts in finance and uh, uh, computation of ratios and all these kind of things. They are no IT expert, they are no, not nerds, yeah? but the new risks uh, <laughs> which uh, appear, um, they are technological. Uh, so here is also a change for us and when I uh, look to uh, risk, sense, risk sensitive uh, tasks which are carried out by, a, by an algorithm. Yeah. Who of my examiners can look into the code and say, well, that's okay, that's not okay. Yeah. Uh, if uh, blockchain is applied with all the inefficiencies you mentioned, somebody has to make sure that uh, processes are reliable uh, and, um, and sustainable. Uh, and so here, um, I would say that, uh, maybe it's a bit exaggerated, but that the digitalization of uh, the banks is the most, the most challenging, uh, um, the biggest challenge since the financial crisis for banking supervisors, because it's changing so fast, uh, so fundamentally, uh, and, uh, and it breaks up the structures uh, and the fundamentals on which our uh, um, traditional supervision is based. Um, have you also changed the way how to hire people at the ECB or at the supervisory um, body of the ECB because of all the new tasks which they have to do? Because clearly someone who is an expert on macroeconomic assessment can't be an expert on uh, which technology is perhaps uh, risky. I would uh, approach uh, this uh, slightly differently and uh, perhaps a bit uh, more positively uh, than uh, Joachim. There are risks. There are risks. Uh, I would uh, make a comparison with a car. There's an engine. We don't uh, fully know how all that engine, every piece of that is functioning, but we use it uh, going from place A to place B. Banks are using, have been using that in uh, trading a long time. Market uh, supervisors in uh, market conduct uh, side uh, have been using it uh, for a long time. We here in the ECB, we have uh, some, some pilots and uh, we have a natural language processing through which we can uh, automatically check fit and uh, proper templates and uh, find uh, red flags. It is uh, something what uh, the machine is doing for us. And uh, of course, we need uh, human, uh, human uh, brains to check that that is, that is uh, correct. Uh, then there's uh, some areas where we use uh, network uh, analysis, uh, like we did in checking what are private equity companies' uh, holdings in, in banks, because they are cross holdings, and there were more than 150,000 uh, interconnecting ownerships. And uh, 
machines made it a visual uh, presentation on, on that. Now our, our clever uh, experts, uh, good supervisors, would have been able to do it uh, at least uh, during their working time here before retiring or so, but uh, machines did it uh, quickly. And uh, as said, it is uh, something where we can uh, work together with banks, especially in data reporting side, and uh, reduce the burden. And it is, uh, there are a lot of areas mm. where we have a common interest. And yeah. would you also say and, that? And uh, then uh, relating to your <laughs> main question, sorry, I didn't uh, answer to that. <laughs> yes, we need to take uh, into account when recruiting people. Yeah. Would you also say that, uh, perhaps a question to Gurkham, that like the new bank in the future will have a lot less people? I know at ING you have a very different cost income ratio than other banks, so and, um, a, yes. a lot lower, I would say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not happy on, where we are. A, a European okay. average. <laughs> no, but honestly, uh, joking <laughs> aside, I mean, the, uh, the banking in the future, given like what you can all uh, automize or digitalize, you think like banking in general will have a lot less staff? I mean, I think if you look at the um, number of transactions and complexity of the transactions that we are doing as banks today compared to 10 years ago, and, and if you rationalize that number with regards to employees, probably you know, there is a huge difference, which means that there has been huge efficiency in the system already. So I think you know, when it comes to activities which are more repetitive, like the RPA, you know, back office activities in most cases, on areas where you can use natural language processing for automatically processing documents, in areas like the contact centers where you know will be more and more VC being replaced by chat and chatbot kind of uh, capabilities. I think there will be changes indeed, but we also see new jobs coming in. Um, we also have what we call customer journey experts now in the organizations which are basically mapping the whole process end to end, having a customer view on how it should work. We have a lot of UX designers. We have you know customer experience uh, experts uh, coming into play. Um, so jobs are a bit changing. I think the, the, the role of human in bringing the expertise, um, uh, decision making together with the algorithms as, as just explained, and also managing the exceptions when it comes to customer service will be there. Uh, but I also believe a lot of the repetitive activities indeed will be, will, will be replaced. Um, and we also see, you know, if you look at the so-called neobanks and their operating models, they, of course, outsource a lot of the activities as well, but with a you know, fraction of, of the amount of FTs that, that we have currently in, in ING, they are able to operate in certain segments. Um, um, so yeah, I think the industry, when it comes to especially the, uh, the, the type of jobs and the roles that we have in, in the banks, uh, we will see changes indeed. So I think, by the way, it's not only banking, of course, industry 4.0, it's a broader discussion around around the society and impact on jobs, but uh, I think banking is not, uh, you know, cannot be immune to that. Yeah, I think you might have a view on that as well because you were nodding and the, yeah. yeah. No, I think you have many technologies that uh, help with the efficiency internally, uh, of course. Uh, one technology or area that was not mentioned is subject cloud, uh, and I think that's also something where the regulators need to look into. Um, uh, the it's, of course, a way to, to save money, to be more efficient, but it's also using the cloud as changing the way you develop software, you exactly. deploy software and, and, and work with customers. And um, there we have, by the way, a disadvantage in Europe that we rely or have to rely on the uh, American uh, providers. Uh, we as Deutsche Börse using this significantly because there is no other uh, alternative. We would like to see uh, some European initiative on that, mm -hmm. but this will, yeah. will uh, definitely uh, um, change uh, the way uh, you work uh, and uh, you, you uh, improve efficiency. But also the other side is, and that was mostly talked about, how you uh, uh, work with, with customers. And I think what we, when we look maybe not only into 2023, 25, so if you look into 2000, uh, 2030 or uh, behind uh, or more in the future, I think uh, banks need to think about how um, 
the interaction with the customer will completely change yeah. the, um, the, the, the banking system. Um, uh, I mean, for me, even personally, and I think everybody agrees, Amazon, uh, Google um, are um, uh, companies that are uh, every day um, uh, available and um, uh, yeah, you act with these companies uh, daily, either we're buying something and if they provide banking services um, and there's the uh, the uh, Mar uh, um, uh, Mr. Microsoft, Bill Gates, uh, banking is necessary, banks not. Um, there might be other players coming up, fintechs uh, that take over these, these roles and technologies help them. Yeah, so-called big tech, they are clearly under yeah, a lot of scrutiny also from the regulators or from the European level for other reasons, but I guess them moving more and more into the payment sphere. We have yeah. seen that in China with Alibaba, for example, which is like the Amazon, Chinese Amazon equivalent for China, which is already providing the fully fledged banking um, yeah. services. So we most likely will get something like that as well here. So what would be the response from regulators, for example, um, on, on that specific topic when we talk about big tech moving into that market? Well, the, uh, the issue is for um, fintech companies and big techs a little bit the same. Um, well, the usual approach of supervisory is we have a definition of banks and this, well, if you take uh, deposits and give loans, you're a bank. And in the traditional understanding, uh, these two functions can only be carried out uh, with the complete value chain yeah, um, with it into the bank. And what we now see is the kind of unbundling of this value chain. Uh, and this unbundling means that parts of, uh, of the classical banking operations are carried out by third party provisors, which are not a bank. And uh, uh, of course, it's not supervised as, as a bank. Uh, and uh, we can only, by the figure of uh, outsourcing requirements, yeah, uh, capture this phenomenon. But this may not uh, be the future uh, because it is maybe even a little bit of illusion. If I tell um, the Volksbank Würzburg uh, when they uh, shift their core banking system into the cloud, uh, please make sure that you control Amazon. Uh, because uh, that's an outsourced uh, uh, task. Uh, so here we might also change our, uh, our approach. Um, this unbundling is a real a big change and maybe we, could, we should consider of changing from the identity-based supervision rather to activity-based supervision. So if you um, um, provide a service for a bank which is bank related and risk sensitive it should be supervised as if it was done by a bank itself but this is this would be of course a completely new world uh, uh, for supervision but these are um, the ideas we have to consider Helena how much pressure do you feel like as a traditional bank coming from those big tech companies who obviously uh, move very fast into the sphere of providing financial services, not necessarily in Europe yet, but in other jurisdictions where perhaps less regulation is on them? Well, I guess um, they are disrupting some traditional thinking, um, setting a new pace in terms of um, development. Um, I would see them as a sparing partner, like in boxing, right? They keep you on your toes. They um, offer a different perspective. and. Um, you then have to evaluate which parts may be relevant to your business, to your strategy with regards to your clients, and which might be just um, you know, an interesting but, idea to, vi to revisit. But they're more threatening than like little fintechs who are evolving somehow like mushrooms all over the place, right? <laughs> I, I, I would agree, but, but I think it goes back also to, to your company's strategy, right? Yeah. Um, what is the unique value proposition that you have? Where do you want to maintain your IP and keep investing into? Which are the areas where you're maybe quite happy actually to collaborate to partner with the big and the small? Um, and which parts are maybe complete utility and we, you're quite happy to completely outsource and create maybe like a SaaS model or anything else where you just get things on demand when you need them and you don't necessarily care 
where it's actually going to get produced. So I think it, it really goes back to a clear strategy and agreement within the company in terms mm. of what they aspire to become or to, to, to be. Uh, what's the European level thinking on uh, what to do with big tech in, in that uh, area of financial services? Well, uh, I don't know whether I can answer on behalf uh, of, of, of the entire Europe, but, uh, but um, the issue there is, uh, like Joachim said, uh, in, in the finance industry, Many sort of long chains have been unbundled, and uh, and uh, like uh, Helena took up, it is also in the interest of banks, depending on their uh, strategies, <coughs> to give up, renounce some parts of their activities, and uh, then uh, when you get a new player there, there are some companies uh, in Europe already just focusing on payments, and uh, their return on equity in that business is quite uh, quite good, hmm. double-digit numbers. And, uh, and uh, that is something w what the banks were not able to do as efficiently. Perhaps uh, there are ways uh, to follow the same system, but uh, technology allows those new firms to take uh, from the very beginning to the end, uh, straight through processing without any human errors uh, in between and, uh, and uh, in a very efficient way. So uh, all in all, innovation in, in, in this industry is, uh, is, uh, is uh, favorable and increases competition and uh, then uh, lowers uh, entry barriers. And I think that that is, uh, that is uh, good for also for the European banking industry. I would like to add uh, two principles uh, and recall two principles of supervision. First is market neutrality. So we are not in favor of traditional banks uh, in comparison to others. That's also what you mentioned as well. As well, and we are also technologically neutral. Yeah. Uh, so uh, don't address uh, the supervisors uh, to uh, to shelter traditional banks from uh, big techs and uh, um, fintechs. Um, but the other side of the coin is, of course, that we have an, a responsibility uh, for the financial the entire financial stability. So we have to make sure uh, that um, um, certain entities uh, do not escape our grasp. And uh, here it is very crucial to emphasize that the firms which are entering into a, into business which uh, requires authorization, then uh, it is the same as uh, what is uh, required from banks. It is not uh, it, more lax. Or, let's or let's so. talk about that yeah. that approach. I think it's called sandbox approach yes, and innovation yes, yes. hubs, which yes. is like. Um, the European way of, I think, enabling uh, fintechs to actually grow and test their products a little bit before actually applying for real licenses, because licensing is clearly a huge uh, entry barrier into the financial service sector. Perhaps you could briefly bring us up to speed what is like behind that and what's the thinking of um, yeah, or how, how that is actually going. Yes, it is, it is so that the um, Innovation Hub, which is uh, for new sort of services and uh, products, uh, we can uh, there uh, communicate with uh, banks and uh, firms and uh, tell what is the regulatory treatment on those uh, services. Sandbox is uh, already where you test these services and uh, you can have a test environment but again, what is crucial is that uh, governance is in place, IT systems and operat operative operational risks are taken care of, and uh, so that it is uh, fulfilling those main criteria of, 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 of the license needed for that, uh, whether that is payments or whether that is uh, then a full banking or something else, it is, it is there. So it is a sort of way to, to, to tell to, to uh, 
new entrants, uh, what is uh, required in, in the market, but that is not an alternate route to, to get a license. Yeah, I mean, fintechs are thriving, especially in Britain, and now with Brexit, there's probably a lot of change coming. Well, obviously, nobody knows how that is going to uh, <laughs> work out in the end, but perhaps, Hauke, what are you hearing, because you have close connection to the fintech scene as well, what are you hearing from them? Is that something they, they I mean, is there a lot of movement coming to the continent now, and which countries do they prefer, if I can say, like they? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if the fintech uh, or in general the startup sector uh, in Europe is uh, generally behind what we see in the US and now also in, in uh, Asia. Uh, we see uh, over the past two, three years that uh, the the capital that's available for startups is increasing here. There was uh, in, in Silicon Valley, there is a network, there's the capital for, for startups in general, easier uh, available than in, in Europe. Uh, a number of initiatives were taken in Europe, among them also Deutsche Börse uh, started a venture network to support uh, startup companies. So there are a lot of initiatives going on, KfW and others are driving initiatives to provide network management skills and capital for, for startups. So there is a lot of uh, that's done in Europe. One uh, area, and you, you said it with uh, the um, uh, with UK, the FCA has er very early, um, two years ago, already started the sandbox approach and were leading uh, in Europe uh, with this approach, uh, providing this sandbox for uh, fintech companies to, to test uh, their services and, and learn and see if they can uh, in the end uh, reach uh, a certain size, critical size, uh, to apply them for a license and, um, and have the critical mass for that. Um, we are behind that uh, in Europe. Um, then your question on will the uh, Brexit change the situation? Um, my view on that is that it will not, uh, probably not change the situation. We don't see uh, startups moving. Uh, we see a number of banks uh, um, setting up their branches here uh, in, in continental Europe, but fintechs um, don't see it as uh, uh, important for them to be in a certain location. They, they work from where they have their talent, they're uh, focused on their talent, on their teams, um, and they mainly stay in uh, the location despite Brexit. Um, uh, and we regret that the British um, uh, people will probably leave, but uh, it's a fine. <coughs> Um, perhaps, Gorkham, you have a view on that as well, how fintech is doing in Europe, because I know that your CEO was one of, was one of the first going into Silicon Valley to actually yeah. have an idea of what digitalization will mean for the future of the world. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> are you more or less uh, looking at fintechs uh, as also a means to um, like getting ahead of the curve and incorporate their ideas and i.e. just take them over? Or is it like a constant dialogue with them? Uh, we partner in most, most cases. Yeah. So it is, um, I mean, we also spin off more than 10 companies out of our own um, innovation funds and venture funds. Those are some of the things that came after the Silicon Valley visit indeed that we have a, a venture fund of up to 700 million euros where we invest in, 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 in companies, but also our own initiatives coming from our own innovation initiatives in the organization. Um, um, so I think, yes, the fintechs have the ideas. They have, the I think, the advantage of zero-based design in a way. You know, you will design things differently if you are designing from scratch. They have the agility also by using things like cloud and, and, and different approaches. They like to the scale. They like to scale the data, in some cases also the experience. And that is something we can offer. We have you know, 40 million customers, we have the data, we have banking know-how, and we see a lot of opportunities for, for partnerships in, in different areas with, with fintechs. Um, I think you know, the second part of the question also when it comes to Europe in, in fintechs, um, we are also looking at, as part of an initiative, what we have in the Netherlands for Kickstart AI to basically put the Netherlands a bit ahead in, in AI. And one of the areas we are looking at is the ecosystem of startups. And, um, and I think we see the challenge that uh, we don't have a lot of the startups coming up in, in fintech, but also in other areas in, in Europe. And especially when they come to a level where they scale up, they tend to go to, the, to Silicon Valley and the US. 
uh, when we talk to the entrepreneurs, they, money is not the only issue because man, capital is also, also available a lot uh, nowadays in, in Europe as well. It is the, uh, the network is a big uh, aspect. Uh, having access to strategic boards, advisors, and know-how when it comes to scaling up a company is a big aspect. But I think also in general, the attitude that we have in the US with regards, in, in Europe with regards to failing and, and you know, learning from failing is, is a, is, seems to be a barrier in you know, companies coming up and scaling up here. We, we don't like failing that much. Uh, we are not as proud as, 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 as Americans when you try some things and, and fail. And also, as I think we need to look at as our own organizations. We, we look at every investment as a business case. We try to see what will be the benefit for me, you know, what is a strategic fit and so on. Where in the US, it, it is a bit of a different attitude when you look at coming to investing into companies. It might be a bit more, more relaxed to create more, you know, and talent ecosystem, et cetera, trying, trying and learning things. Um, so I think money is part of it, the capital, but I think changing our attitude in a way and building this incubation capabilities where we do projects with startups where they try and fail and we give data and know-how in a secure way, of course, using sandbox and so on, and, and we build things together. That is something that we need to do more and more, and that's what we are trying to do in, um, in ING. Okay. Uh, you yeah. can uh, remind it, uh, me. Uh, one one uh, issue we require from, uh, from uh, firms in, in, in the sandbox, and uh, it is, uh, of course, we do not want uh, them uh, to fail and uh, we want uh, them to succeed. Mm -hmm. But uh, one issue is that uh, we require them to submit us uh, an exit plan so that we know what happens if they are failing. And uh, that is also crucial. So you perhaps uh, raise a bar a bit, but uh, then you're, you're confident that uh, you have a, the, that kind of startups which are seriously in in thinking in, in entering the business. Helena, you were nodding, and perhaps you can expand a little bit on that, what Gurken was saying, how you are doing that, uh, like cooperation with fintechs inside Deutsche Bank. Sure. Um, we encourage quite a lot of internal innovation as well. So we do have innovation labs in all of our main hubs, really encouraging employees also take um, a time off if they have any particular idea that they would like to pursue a bit further and create like a sandbox solution that they would like to present um, to the senior at the regional or um, global um, management. Um, so that is really heavily encouraged. And then, of course, strategic partnerships, um, where from the business perspective, we can again connect um, with those teams who are very close to the fintech market um, locally, and we can come to them with some specific propositions or um, pain points that we have identified in the current offering, um, changing expectations from our clients and use them as an additional kind of external um, place where we can brainstorm and potentially come up with slightly different ideas, um, less restricted both in terms of technology but also internal processes that then could be um, developed and explored further um, and re reaching a certain level of maturity could be brought back into the business. So it's a combination of encouraging your all internal employees and ultimately boosting their digital IQ um, which is quite rewarding, especially for the newer generation that is coming into the bank. But then, of course, staying connected with the uh, um, fintechs and also the, the bigger tech companies that are strategic partners of ours for these type of specific use cases, ideas, and scenarios where we use them to further develop and mature those ideas. But how, how important would you say are fintechs to drive the innovation process? Because you were saying a lot of, of that already happens inside the bank, but like if you had a ratio, like say 50-50 or 30-70, just like good guess. I guess maybe just to clarify, the internal innovation piece is also set up in a way like a fintech. It's away from the standard processes so that specific employees with ideas can actually step out for a month or two into those um, innovation labs and actually develop their ideas using different technology that might be um, appropriate or um, approved within the bank to develop those ideas and mature them further before presenting that yes, as a business case as well, um, to then hopefully get more um, funding 
more resources to bring it back into the business and integrate it with the existing infrastructure. So we're encouraging that innovation culture outside the existing, in some cases, maybe limiting environment that the banks are operating in um, to ensure that at least at the initial stage, we're not inhibiting those um, developments by internal processes. Yeah. Well, time is moving fast, I would say. Um, perhaps you start to think about some questions and we have the final round here on, uh, on stage. Um, I was initially thinking about asking you about what needs to, what do we need to have to that fintechs can prosper, but I think it might be more interesting to hear from you what actually the biggest development in terms of digitalization and in your area of regulation will be um, for the next couple of years. So which topics are you looking at and thinking, well, that's hot perhaps next year and in 2000. 21. Perhaps we start with you, Gurkham. Yeah, I think, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's more in the area of, of machine learning and analytics. Mm. Um, in coming up with ways that you can scale models in a fast way, that is going to be the key going forward. I think that would be a big differentiator between successful and less successful companies in this area in general. Everybody's trying to do things. I think moving from a bit of an experimentation phase to really industrializing it, and virtually across every part of the bank, right? So starting from, of course, customer interactions and marketing, but also customer dialogue when it comes to chatbots, voice assistance, new ways of interacting with intelligence, but also risk, credit acceptance models, early warning models, pricing, KYC, AML, every part of the bank virtually is impacted by that, and we are working on those. But you know, what is your, your capability in doing, being able to do it in, in, in quickly, in scale, putting things fast into production uh, with real impact? I think that's going to be a key differentiator. I believe, you know, we passed the stage that the idea, great idea around AI was, was, was key. It's now really an execution phase. And obviously, together with that comes the, the, you know, the important aspect of the fairness, uh, the uh, uh, transparency and robustness of everything that you build in this field. And also building those capabilities, also as much as in automated fashion, will be, will be very critical going forward. Would you uh, go as far as saying that those banks who are not embracing digital change won't probably not be around in, say, 10 years? I mean, digital change is a broad concept. I will yeah. even... Yes, I will definitely say that. Uh, I can easily say that, I think. But we have seen that also in, 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 you know, in the adaption. I think the, the importance to, uh, of being able to be adapt to the exponential change is becoming more and more critical. And we also see it already in, you know, if you look at the price book ratio of, of, of winners and losers in different industries, the gap is growing. Um, so, so really, I think few winners will emerge. And I don't know if scale or is it the adaption speed to technology, I think probably is a combination of all of that, will determine the, uh, the winners in this industry. And I mean, my field is AI, so I believe it is really the next big thing in, in banking. So, so that's why I'm trying to keep investing in that. Helena, what's your view? What's the next big thing? <laughs> um, without wanting to repeat what you said, because my <laughs> team focuses a lot on AI as well. Um, for me, it's data, because data is the key enabler for AI or real-time contextual insights that the clients want. Um, that's the next big thing. Whoever you know, figures out how to get that um, in the most commercially efficient way, um, and not just the data that you hold, but everything that the customer finds relevant and contextually um, beneficial, that's for me the next big thing. Um, what are you looking at from the regulatory side of things, or what do you think will kind of keeps you busy um, next year and the years after that? Well, the risk-sensitive areas are, of course, uh, for us the most Im important one. That's, uh, of course, IT security, uh, resilience, uh, reliability uh, of blockchain uh, changes, uh, risk-relevant function of AI and so on. But I uh, like to mention another element which uh, can really move the sector very fundamentally, and that's the tokenization of uh, various forms of assets. It's not only money, it's securities, everything. and uh, the tokenization would mean that uh, means in a sense uh, that um, value at this stage uh, state 
um, you can uh, convey information in the internet, but with the tokenization, you can also send value mm, by the internet. And mm. this, of course, mm. can break up the whole system of uh, banking because you don't need uh, an intermediary in between. Uh, and we see already in uh, some uh, places experiments, but also prototypes of tokenization of uh, certain types of assets. You are working on that, your colleagues in Stuttgart and wherever. So this can really make uh, a, big, uh, a, a big difference. And another, uh, another area I would like to mention is that um, the, the digitization which has, uh, to a certain extent, been uh, an issue of for the first movers, yeah, big techs, fintechs, but also innovative banks like ING, but also uh, various other banks. It now um, really uh, goes to the mainstream, and the cloud technology is one important uh, issue here because cloud technology allows every small and medium-sized banks to make full use of the whole range of new technologies which are there. Uh, so it will move from some top uh, people to, uh, to the mainstream of banks. And this is, of course, a big issue for the supervisors because then uh, we have it in all the banks uh, and uh, in a big uh, variety. So we are encouraging banks to uh, digitize more. That's also an issue of competitiveness. Uh, we want to be an enabler of digitalization, but we have to make sure that the risks are under control. Hauke? I think many technologies were already mentioned, analytic, analytics, big data, cloud, um, cybersecurity, something that was not that much discussed uh, today uh, is a, a big uh, subject. So I think there are many technologies and uh, I think we all agree that uh, there are many things coming up uh, in the future. So I think the, the big thing in, in the future is more the way the uh, the business model of, of banks or the financial uh, system is, is changing. And this is something uh, the regulator, the ECB, um, they need to look at this, um, how it will also change the way companies uh, need to be supervised or which companies need to be mm -hmm. supervised. Is it the, the banks, the traditional banks, uh, you said it in the beginning, or is it also the Googles, Amazons uh, of this world? that uh, um, need to be included in this because they are taking over parts of the, the value chain. So I think this is what, what will, will impact uh, um, the, the future of the financial system more than the individual technologies. There's many, uh, many things that, that will come. So, <clears throat> Pente, what are you working on for next year and well, the years? Uh, I think that this, uh, was uh, taken up uh, there are several issues uh, which uh, are important. It is a moving target. And uh, as supervisors, we need to evolve uh, in parallel with the te te technology. And, uh, and uh, there are artificial intelligence, machine learning, those issues uh, uh, which we need to follow. Two issues I would like to implement so that next time when we have this kind of conference, we can tell about the imp imp having implemented first a reduction of reporting, uh, data reporting in, in, in like, uh, like uh, uh, administrative work. And uh, this morning, our chair also uh, made a point on, 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 on that. The second is that we make use of modern technology in our work processes so that our staff can free up time from repetitive work into more value-added uh, supervisory work that is very, very crucial. And the final point is that uh, as the SSM is uh, consisting of national supervisors and the ECB, we have the benefit of, of working together and, uh, and uh, making use of best practices, whether that is in, in, here in Joachim's uh, uh, bank or whether that is in uh, uh, Margareta's uh, bank or others. And uh, already today we see that uh, quite uh, many of our, our national supervisors are pretty well advanced in, in these areas, and uh, we need to share that uh, information and uh, make use of international collaboration also a bit outside. And that we have started with uh, 
monetary authority of Singapore and uh, Fed uh, San Francisco, making sure that we keep abreast of what happens in this field. Well, thank you very much. And uh, now it's time to open up to questions from the audience. So who has a question? Don't be shy. No? Think so. Yeah. <laughs> um, here in the second row, please. Thank you, uh, Dominic Laborex from our uh, single resolution board. It's not about resolution, by the way. But I think we have not discussed the question of data protection and the interrelationship between these new technologies and the limits um, we have to respect uh, concerning individual data protection. How do you address, in, in particular in banks, this particular question? Because to develop uh, uh, intelligence about uh, customers uh, activities, it's fine, but it, it, it is related, obviously, to individual data. And so uh, how do you manage that, this contradiction between protecting data coming from uh, individuals and uh, these new technologies? Uh, Gorkami, you would like to answer? Yeah, so it is obviously one of the important areas. And um, as I mentioned, when it comes to fairness, transparency, and robustness of the models, Part of that is also about the type of data that you use to train and test those models, and also the production data that you use against that. Obviously, we have the regulations around GDPR and, the, uh, and, and, and privacy regulations. But also on top of that, uh, we have a set of uh, data ethics rules in the organization. Um, uh, that's basically a list of seven rules around in which, you know, how we treat data in as an organization beyond GDPR, let's say. And also we have uh, certain checkpoints in the development process where um, uh, the data that's being used is, is checked against yeah. bias, but also against uh, um, uh, the source and the lineage and privacy related things. And for people, when there is a doubt, we also have a data, uh, global data ethics councils in the organization in the countries, but also we have a global data ethics council where I'm also uh, sitting as a member. And there we really discuss the dilemmas, uh, specific dilemmas that can come which doesn't really, you know, uh, uh, are, are not clearly, the gray areas I think was mentioned today. So that there are cases where gray areas where we need to also address as, as an organization. But on top of that, I think uh, it's important to also build the uh, checks and controls, risk-based uh, first, second, and third line systems when regards to models as well. So we have a, um, a separate organization for model validation. It's not only for regulatory models, but every model that we build is subject to validation by a second line for us. Um, and I mean, we also apply a risk-based approach there. Uh, they're also building their own challenger models to validate the models that has been developed in different parts of the organization. So I think all of these things in, needs to be in place to not only for data protection for, for regulatory perspective, but also you know, everything against the, the bias in your data. And it can be you know, <coughs> primary or secondary bias, basically bias that you don't immediately see the bias that you can have inherently in your model, um, and also how you use that model for what purpose when it comes to ethical dilemmas, those, those structures need to be really in place to, to feel safe around this. Um, and I think the challenge is, again, if you want to scale up and automate things, how much of this you can embed in your pipeline to say in automatically detecting bias while you're also building models in an earlier phase and so on. And there are a lot of technical developments also coming up there. Joachim, you want well, I just to wanted to add uh, um, uh, a brief uh, consideration. Well, first of all, of course, supervisors uh, make sure under the compliance regime that uh, all these uh, regulations are respected. But I wanted to point to a, uh, to a dilemma um, which banks face, but also institutions like ours face. And that is that uh, the underlying ideas for GDPR, but also PSD2, uh, were elaborated or set up in a period far before mm -hmm. big data and big techs. Uh, and um, uh, on the un one hand, um, GDPR is also a, an example where others in the world follow. On the other hand, it's a big obstacle to use big, uh, to use big data, of course. And when I see people giving their data uh, enormous amount of data to whatever companies in the world with stores in each uh, in uh, under, in, the, in the ocean or whatever. Yeah, um, so the sensitivity 
uh, of, um, of the consumer has, let's say, shifted a little bit from this uh, approach, oh, this is my data, nobody should uh, look, have a look at it. On the other hand, it is also uh, uh, the, the consumer benefits yeah, when organizations use their data to make better products and more well-designed products. So here, I think, um, could also be a point where uh, reconsideration of these ideas uh, should start. Um, because if we, uh, if we stick to that very restrictive approach, it is clear that we will have uh, an everlasting uh, disadvantage in competitiveness to, uh, to other jurisdictions where these restrictions don't exist. Yeah, that's very much true. I have to think about Facebook when you say that because you really get very good advertisements <laughs> if they use your data <laughs> properly. Uh, another question here in the front row. Um, is it still? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you and thank you for an interesting discussion. But uh, at the end here, someone uh, mentioned the cyber security and I think that is something that we can also see that the cyber risks are also increasing a lot. And if uh, it seems like technology now can, I mean, provide us with an enormous amount of new services to customers. So my question is a little bit, are we doing enough uh, preparations or do, do we have enough contingency plans also for um, if electricity goes away, if we don't have internet, I think one of the larger stock exchanges in the Northern Europe had a stop yeah. of several hours last week. So, I mean, uh, there is a risk always with uh, new techniques that you are running away, but you are not making sure that you have uh, enough uh, yeah. Uh, contingency for also uh, being able to serve your customers in, in yeah. bad times. Perhaps how can you as an infrastructure provider, yeah. perhaps you can take that. I mean, I, I can say from, from a view of Deutsche Börse that we spend a huge amount of time and efforts on uh, cyber security, on business continuity management. Um, uh, we, we do regular tests. Um, um, of our systems, of our people, how they can move and prepare in case of uh, emergency. And um, there is always a residual re risk that, that will never go away. But I think um, coming from a technology world, before I joined Deutsche Börse, I was in tech uh, technology world, um, I would say the, the whole financial industry is uh, uh, doing really a lot uh, on preparing themselves for, for any uh, uh, emergencies and also always staying on top of the latest technology. On top of that, the regulator, in this case for us, uh, Bundesbank, Bafin, um, they are checking us regularly and uh, uh, checking our preparedness in a, in, in a really uh, tough and, and consistent way. <coughs> <clears throat> Helena, perhaps you have a view on cybersecurity as well. Yeah, they, it's definitely an area that is heavily invested into, right? Just as a bank, you just can't afford to have your systems down. Um, when we're in the number one euro clear, it's a top priority. Um, but we're also investing actually in new technologies to strengthen that area, for example, around fraud prevention or generally cybersecurity. Um, you know, everything that you've kind of said in terms of uh, using a lot of data sets to train your um, new algorithms to ensure that, you know, we can sustain any type of attacks and can um, detect them early enough before they cause any major damage. But it is certainly an area of huge investment. Well, we saw in the last years that, be, that banks are really stepping up their efforts mm -hmm. uh, in uh, IT security um, and um, well, there are two levels. One level is, let's say, the the basic uh, the basic requirements for IT security, which are very very easy. Yeah, uh, like uh, making the batches uh, don't do not circumvent the uh, the pin codes and these kind of things. And well, but there we have seen a, a, a very big uh, um, lacks uh, in the in the system, and that they have been closed. Uh, but uh, the the worrisome point is that the vulnerabilities are rising quicker uh, than uh, the uh, tools for uh, shields. Any more questions? Yeah, um, 
You get a microphone. Thank you. Maybe a follow-up to the cyber risk, in particular on the cost-benefit analysis, because, of course, just like in AI, I think you alluded to that, investment in cyber security can be as, you know, as, as, as long as a piece of string. So what considerations go into the cost-benefit analysis of cyber security in particular versus outsourcing it? Because this is also a very conveniently outsourceable activity. It depends on the risk that you know, is assigned to a particular area of business, a uh, particular um, piece of technology as well, right? So it, it will vary. There isn't like one rule that you would apply. But I would generally say from the um, business case perspective, um, investment in this area is probably not going through the same scrutiny as investing into a new product because the bank just understands that this is an area that we cannot get wrong. How much uh, does regulation uh, look into how, what can you like sort of outsource when it comes to looking into cyber security risks? Because, because clearly, I mean, it's clearly a very sensitive area. Would you? It is. Um, it is something what uh, appeared already that uh, that uh, supervisors are following it. It is a continuous work. It is part of our work to check what are contingency plans of our, our, our banks and uh, so that uh, they are sufficient. Justin made a question whether that is sufficient. Well, the outcome will show the case should be looked to the end. Nobody knows whether that is uh, really sufficient. But uh, again, here is, uh, is the fact that we have a common interest, all parties have a common interest here so that uh, it is not something where supervisors and uh, then supervised entities would uh, think differently and that helps and uh, there's uh, even cooperation in, in, in those areas and uh, that uh, relates to know your customer or terrorist financing and uh, all those areas and uh, more perhaps could be done in, in, in that front. My interpretation or my observation is that banks don't want to outsource their responsibility uh, for IT security, and by the way, they are not allowed to either. <laughs> okay, any more questions? Well, if that's not the case, thank you very much, and uh, thank you to uh, yeah, for that very interesting panel. Um,